there is you you have access to this under the syllabus and it sort of shows what day we're on what the subjects we should be covering on that day are and um try to color code it just so we don't get completely lost and i try to color code the sections so you have it by chapter um feel free to get ahead that's fine like if we're if you're getting everything and you're understanding stuff feel free to jump ahead like you can always be ahead um in in the lecture i'm going to try and keep more or less to these things if we get if really, we get really more than a few days then I will readjust this. Uh, but as it is, we're, we're more or less on track and hopefully we keep more or less on track. Some of these things, um, like for example, intermolecular forces, stability and functional groups. We're gonna talk a bit about stability next class. Uh, and that really plays into um, the acid and base stuff. And I have to change this because holy shit, some of this stuff got a little bit off track. So I'm going to update this because we're we're going to do some of this stuff first. Uh, no, I changed my mind. Um, OK, I'm going to be updating the syllabus today after class because this first part has been constant and then suddenly we're jumping. We're following through to chapter three and that's not what the next lecture is. Next lecture is going to talk about acids and bases, which is down here. So I will update this to match what the syllabus says, because the syllabus doesn't say this. And we're following the syllabus. So I will update this briefly, but for next class, um, the syllabus is still completely accurate. It's just Friday, we're going to get a little bit off and I'll have to move this around. So this this has been useful up to, this has been completely accurate up till now. Um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, that, that just, yes. And now I'm noticing it's not going to be accurate as of Friday, so I need to update that. Uh, so the assignment due Friday is going to be posted Thursday. So it's going to go live on Thursday. You're going to have 48 hours. Then I can what, shut down. Friday? Yeah, so it doesn't exist yet. It hasn't been posted yet. It's not. You can't find it yet because it's not there because you won't have access to it until you have access to it. Yeah, it says it's due those days. It's, it's only doable those days as well. Uh, yeah, it's, it's due. Yeah, it's, it's due Friday, but it's only due. It's kind of like a little mini, very mini. It's a mini quiz. It's much, much shorter than any of the assi other assignments. Yeah, it's on chap it's on chapters one and two. It's up to sort of stuff that we've kind of done. That was a, a good side that was shared. So yeah, if you're not muted, we can hear all your groans. If you are muted, we can't hear your drones. Like, feel free to share them. Uh, what do I want to share? Share the screen. OK, so again, this is really driven by you guys and what you want to cover on here. So up till now, you should have covered chapter five or, or lecture five, which covers Intermolecular forces and isomerization, you should be covering that. I'm happy to continue answering questions about atomic and molecular the orbitals and Vesper theory. Um, you do have practice questions that are on all the other assignments and at the back of the book. This, this first one is going to be really straightforward. I, I promise. Uh, like This is going to be the one you're going to want to keep. And I... I this is kind of the practice assignment for the other ones, because if you completely balls this up, you've got three more cracks in it. The assignment, yeah, the assignments I posted are the ones that you just do for fun. Well, not for fun, but for your own edification. Where I'm going to post a short top hat using top hat thingy assignment. It is going to take you 20 minutes. There's going to be five questions or something. Everyone's going to get a different five questions. You answer them. You don't get to go back. 
you submit your answers, you get your grade, you get whatever 5% of your mark or 2.5% of your mark, I can't remember how much it's worth. But instead of having like seven midterms where we're just doing these things that you don't need to study for them, you just get your materials out and think about it. And if you've been keeping up with the course, it's going to be pretty straightforward. Uh, no, there's no time limit, but you have you have to submit them by the end of day Friday. Um, I'm sorry, I haven't decided if it's multiple choice or not. It will it will be auto marking, but I don't know if it's going to be multiple choice. There's all sorts of tools that we can use and matching and things. Uh, new protections we're going to get to Alyssa. You're way ahead of the rest of the class, so good for you. But we are going to get to those. Um, the homework questions you have in top hat are very different from the ones we're doing in class, like the ones in the lec in the in the lectures. Uh, Clara, it's whenever I said it is in the assignment. I think it is. I think it is Friday and Saturday. Yeah, OK, so the ones we're doing in the lectures are more typical of I think questions we're going to ask the questions in top hat are the ones that top hat has. If I, I think it's really good to understand the fundamental concepts, the textbook's pretty good for that. If you want to see what my questions are like, take a look at my assignments, um, which are under assignments. That's much more like my questions. I'll also post old midterms and things up there. Um, probably in the coming weeks, so you can start taking a look at that as well. Um, I think it's Friday, Saturday. It's I need to check what the exact dates are. It's whatever the dates are in the syllabus. I think I get. I think I give you Friday and I give you Saturday. So if you can't do things on Saturday, you can, Saturday do, you can do it. On if you're working on Friday, because you have lots of other things, that you can do it on Saturday. I just just if you have a real, one really bad day, then you have one day at least. Um, yeah, if you're confused about naming. There is a book uploaded to the resource. It's not really a book. It's a pamphlet uploaded to the resources called the ABCs of naming. It is wonderful. Um, it's probably a really good place to start. Everything is open book in this course. You just can't use other people, but you can always use your other resources uh, because if I told you not to, you'd use them anyways. So let's just always say it's going to be open book. Yeah, I know I've given you a full. It's, it's a really good nor it's a really good resource for naming. Um, it's excellent. And I know that the reason I don't go through this naming in this class is a I don't think it's very important, uh, except when we're going to talk about serochemistry, then I think it's important. And B, a lot of you will have spent months doing naming in a high school, uh, and I don't want to resubject you to the trauma. The nomenclature game is posted in the syllabus. It's called Org 101 or something. You can also practice using that. Everything is in the freaking syllabus. And. You know, it's it's a joke saying, you know, professor says things in the syllabus, but so far everything's in the syllabus. Read the syllabus. OK, question. I got one question before class. Uh, yes, we are Drake. Uh, Guntas. I, I will, but I might do it later on when we're getting more to stability and resonance in the acid base thing that's coming. So I got a question saying uh, I don't understand CO2. Or I don't understand part of CO2. The question was more the, the student sending me this was more comfortable with that. They actually put more context in there, but let's let's they were basically came down to this. OK, so let's walk through. Let's say the question was. Um, a, assign the hybridization of each of the atoms. B, draw the linear combination of atomic orbitals for each for this whole molecule thingy. Um, and C, give me the geometry around the central carbon atom. I'm, I'm just trying to think of what how I could, you know, mess with you. Um, OK, so. Uh, yeah, uh, Fatima, that, that's going to be really central to the next whole section of the course. We're going to be going over that in quite a lot of detail. But this, is, this we're just going to practice trying to draw these and understand what this is before we start trying to rank them. We'll worry about ranking in a bit. OK, so if we have this kind of molecule, then the way to start is make sure, and this is like take CO2. First thing you should do is draw CO2 if you can. Put in the lone pairs. And the question was specifically about 
uh, the electron configuration on this, and that's what somebody was really interested in. So I don't really understand how this whole hybridization thingy works. So let's think about what we need here. So one thing we can do again is we can count the number of different things around each of the atoms where a thing is an atom or a lone pair. So how many different things are around that central carbon where the thing is either an atom or a lone pair? Okay, Mohammed answered the question. Amber said SP3, which wasn't <laughs> which wasn't a number. <laughs> We're getting a lot of twos. Okay, two, perfect. So what, what that generally means is you need two bonding orbitals, or you need two orbitals that can make bonds. Another way of thinking about this, if this makes more sense for you, is how many pi bonds are possible, including possible resonance structures and things. And the answer there is also two. So what carbon? Carbon is normally, you know, again, we're going to ignore the 1s completely because screw 1s. That's normal carbon, right? Now, this carbon, needs two p two p orbitals why does it need two p orbitals well it's got two double bonds and it needs one p orbital for one double bond one p orbital for another double bond so it needs to reserve two p orbitals now it needs to make two single bonds and those single bonds are always made with hybridized orbitals you cannot make a single unless you're hydrogen you cannot make a single bond with an S orbital. You cannot make a single bond with a P orbital. There are a few really weird exceptions, so we are not going to talk about those in this class. So we're going to fall into the fact that you cannot make a single bond with a P orbital. You must make single bonds with hybridized orbitals. And there's two of them. So you need two orbitals to get two orbitals. So you take the S orbital, you always take the S orbital, and you take a P orbital because you need two, and one plus one is two. And you throw those into your molecular blender. Molecular blender. There. I don't know. It looks more like a coffee with some whipped cream on top. Actually, I have no idea what it actually looks like. So I'm gonna I'm gonna annotate it as blender. And I don't use blenders, as you can probably tell by the way that I draw. So this is your sp orbitals, and these are your p orbitals, and we are going to put a single electron in each of them. So this is what carbon is doing in the atom, as it's just a carbon atom, like in space, away from everything. And in this molecule, it's got one electron in each of its sp orbitals and one electron in each of its p orbitals. Why not two electrons in the sp orbitals? Because they're lower energy and you go like, well, why wouldn't I just do this? Like this is lower energy. And you're right, that is lower energy. You can't make freaking bonds if you have two electrons in your sp orbital. You need one electron so it can make a bond with another single electron in somebody else's sp orbital. So this this is just the rules. This is how it works. Um, because in the molecule, you're all we're always when we draw this, we always think, OK, lower poly exclusion principle, the Hans principle and all those things lower. Start with the lowest one, double them up, then add the higher ones. That's only true for the atom in isolation. As soon as you put it into the molecule and if you're hybridized, you're in a molecule. Then you need to take into account the bonds you're making. So the carbon looks like this. What about the oxygen? Carbon will always do this right. Uh, Alia, carbon will always hybridize. Carbon will not always go SP. 
There are very few cryo P carbons actually. Uh, I think assignment X is ahead of the first assignment. Um, the first assignment that we're going to do is really, really preliminary stuff because the class barely starts before we have this assignment. It's kind of ridiculous. Um, I would accept either. So I, I assign, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name right. Uh, I would accept your SP2. I would also accept, accept. We went over this last class, didn't we? Malika's SP. And I really hope I got that right this time. Uh, I personally, I think I'm more on team SP, but I would accept SP2. It's perfectly acceptable. So why, why am I saying that you can be either? Well, let's think about this for a second. And I really hope this is what you were thinking, Malika. There is a resonance structure that we can draw. So, um, if I can break any bond and move electrons, I can do that. Now, so I draw a resonance arrow. This is a double headed arrow. This is saying that this is resonance again. Note again, my arrow there with the electrons says electrons are going from the bond onto the oxygen. It's going to be negatively charged. It's going to have three lone pairs. It's going to have a positive charge on carbon. This is a stupid resonance structure, but it's still there. And then what I can actually do is I can use a lone pair on oxygen to create a new triple bond to carbon. So every molecule here is a valid Lewis structure, which is essential. No one is making more using more than four orbitals in any case. There's nothing wrong with any of those structures. That bottom structure. The oxygen is using making two pi bonds, and if it's doing that, it must be SP. If it's not SP, it can't access that bottom structure. Now, the structure of carbon dioxide, uh, I'm not, the problem is because it's completely symmetrical. I'm not sure if we can ever tell if there's partial triple bond nature to those bonds or if they're just pretty much double bonds. Um, I, my feeling is, yeah, of course, there's partial triple bond nature. It can do resonance, it's going to do resonance. So I prefer SP as an answer, but I will, this case, I would accept SP2 as well. Yeah, so. Okay, uh, Malika gets it. Yeah, it makes a triple bond. So if we're doing this, that means that, you know, let's take a look at that central carbon. It's SP. So it's got a P orbital directly in the plane of the page. I'm going to draw an SP orbital. I don't differentiate SP, SP2, SP3. They all look the freaking same. Um, the SP, I guess, are squatter and a bit more spherical. Who cares? I don't have my video on and I'm staring at the camera like an idiot. I'll now stare at the camera with the idiot and it'll record my being an idiot. So it doesn't matter if it's SP, SP2, SP3. They look identical in these diagrams. Uh, I make them look like sausages because I suck at drawing. But if you try and give them this kind of P, like a shape, like half a P orbital, that's that's cool. That's probably the best shape. And that's what I'm trying to do here. Just basically looks like balloon animals. Um, so if carbon got one P orbital, and this P orbital, remember the P orbital is made up of two lobes. They are opposite each other. I am just drawing them directly in the plane. Then if this oxygen can be SP, this other oxygen over here can also be SP. They're both everything's SP under this argument. So those are easy. Then both oxygens have two electrons in 
and that's P orbital. Carbon's got an electron in this orbital. This oxygen has a single electron in this orbital. And I think we might draw two electrons for this oxygen in this orbital because it's, it's one of its lone pairs, sing in the P. The other P orbital has to be perpendicular to everything. And the only way it can be perpendicular to everything if it's going directly in and out of the page. So this is coming out towards you. And in this case, this electron has a single orbital electron in it. This orbital has a single electron in it because it's carbon again. Carbon has one electron, both those p orbitals. This oxygen has its lone pair in it. And if we want, we can also put electrons into these sp orbitals. Uh, they're assumed. You don't need to draw them if it's a sigma bond. But if we're being completionist here, might as well. So we've drawn where all the electrons are, and we've labeled it. And we've assigned the hybridization and now we just need to assign the geometry around the metal carbon. Okay, why why is an auction an SP2? It's okay to make an auction in SP2. The thing is, is if this oxygen down here, if oxygen here is making a triple bond in one of the resonance structures, it needs to have two p orbitals. Because if it's not, if it's making a dual bond, it needs to have two p orbitals. And you can't rehybridize between resonance structures. They're all the same thing at the same time. So to access this final resonance structure, oxygen must have two p orbitals. And if oxygen has two p orbitals, it's sp. Does that make sense? Amber, Drake, and Alan. No, it's not Alan. It's not Alan. Aurora. Aurora, Amber, and Drake. But yeah, so if you're not looking at the resonance structures, auction SP2, yes, but you're always looking at the resonance structures. If, if you're not looking at the resonance structures, you're doing it wrong. Yeah. The problem is Lewis structures are one way of drawing a molecule. They're only one representation of the molecule. We always need to consider the resonance structures. Uh, it doesn't, so Christian asked, how did you know which orbital stick the electron pairs? It didn't matter. Didn't matter which one I put them in. So how do we do the resonance structures? So, okay. So let's think of a, another question. So this is why I think the intermolecular force and isomerization stuff is pretty straightforward. I think this resonance structure stuff is a lot harder because it, it is a lot harder. You're not stupid. It's a lot harder. OK, let's look at a, a, a simpler example. Um, OK, so. This is um, formamide. Anyways, the amide bond found in every single peptide and protein in your body is great. So that's not adult that I started drawing dots where I then deleted them. So we have this. OK. You have to think about are there resonance structures for this molecule? And again, how do I know if there are resonance structures for this molecule? What I look for is, do I see any sp2 hybridized atoms in the Lewis structure that is drawn for me? And the answer here is yes, I do. Hopefully right off the bat, you can identify that these two are sp2. Okay? They're making it all bond. 
clearly they have to have a p orbital. They have to be able to make a pi bond. To make a pi bond, you need a p orbital. You cannot be sp3. Um, so Victoria said, why is it the better one to draw? It's not. It just exists. And you can't wish it away. This is the best one to draw. Holy shit, you'd want to draw that. That's by far the best one to draw. But just because it's the best one to draw doesn't mean the other one doesn't exist. Like... Yeah. I'm trying to think of an analogy. I can't right now. When I say SP2, I don't necessarily mean there's double bond. Um, you can have SP2s without double bonds. And we're going to see that here. But generally, if you can, by inspection, which ones can you do? And by inspection, it's it's uh, you see a double bond here, you know there has to be a pi bond. Uh, Lawrence, when you draw the orbitals, you should draw the most stable resonance structure. Well, no, what we're yes, but here, that's all the resonance structures. I'm not saying where the pi bonds are, right? I'm not saying there is one pi bond here and one pi bond here. I'm not defining, uh, I, I'm using red on red, it's really hard to see what I'm trying to say. Like, what we draw with that main resonance structure here is this. But when I drew the orbitals, I didn't say that. There's nothing stopping this being one pi bond there, one pi bond here. I don't need to redraw anything. I need to move some electrons around, but that's fine. Electrons move. Did this structure here applies to all the resonance structures? Or I could have the triple bond on the other side and I wouldn't need to redraw any structures. It will be exactly the same. So when I draw these orbital diagrams, I am drawing all resonance structures are present within them. Yeah. I didn't label where the pi bond was. I was covering all my resonance structures at the same time. Yeah, or, orbital diagrams like this are the best description of the molecule because the orbitals never change between resonance structures. The resonance structure is just showing I could have a bond here or I could have a bond here. The orbital diagram says these orbitals are all next to each other. Pick where you want the bonds. Yeah, the best one is two double bonds. That's where charges are best and when you put the electrons in the right spot, it all works. But the electrons are just flowing, right? Like I'm drawing as though this is real. This isn't none of this shit's real. We're it's just we can't draw molecular orbitals. Our brains will explode. Um, so we instead draw these simulacra of them. Um, what you can do is you can label the pi. If I ask you to label the pi bonds, you draw one set of them, whichever ones you want, and any of the answers are right. So Divjot said. Um, so do we never label a pi bond follow this method? Well, you can draw in the pi bond and you label it. And I go, yeah, you've drawn one. You, you've assigned the pi bond to one spot and you're saying, hey, um, this is one possibility. But you're not going to need to erase or change any orbitals to move that pi bond around. You would just switch where the pi bond is. So in a question, I would ask you to draw the pi bond or not draw the pi bond. And if I ask you to draw the pi bond, just draw any of the possible pi bonds. They're all right. Or I might ask you to show, yeah. It is when you first see it, and that's why you need to practice. There's lots of practice on the assignments. There's a lot of practice on the assignments. So let's think about this one. So we have the oxygen and the carbon are sp2, likely. This one we know must be sp2. That this carbon has no choice. It is attached to three things making three single bonds. So there is no way it can be SP, right? Because if it was SP, it could only be attached to making two single bonds, but it's making three single bonds. It cannot be SP. It also cannot be SP3 because it's making a pi bond. 
So it must be sp2. There is no other option. The oxygen could technically be sp, but it's next to an sp2 atom and it can't make more than one pi bond because the atom next to it can only make one pi bond and the, you can't make a pi bond to something you're not connected to. So the oxygen is forced to be sp2 because the carbon is sp2. This carbon here must be sp3 because it is attached to four different things, it is making like four different bonds. It has no choice, it must be sp3. It's attached to four different atoms. The two hydrogens must be S. It's this nitrogen, which is unclear. The way we've drawn it, there are four things, three sigma bonds and a lone pair. And so it can be sp3. And it will be sp3 unless it can participate in resonance, because if it can, if it can make a bond, a bond is better. And so can it make, can it participate in resonance? That's the question. I think so, yes. SP2 is trigonal planar, SP3 is tetrahedral, absolutely. I'm getting some yeses. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna draw this stepwise. We have a resonance arrow. So what, what we're never allowed to do is have an atom use more than four orbitals. You cannot use five orbitals. So, if I draw one arrow, your first arrow should always be breaking a double bond. You're drawing one arrow at a time. Okay. I am drawing the arrow such that the electrons in the carbon oxygen bond go on to oxygen. And they're going on to oxygen rather than carbon because oxygen is more electronegative. They went on to carbon, we would have an O plus and a C minus. That's worse than an O minus and a C plus because oxygen is more electronegative. What does carbon being sp2 have to do with oxygen being sp2? Um, I'll get to that in a second there, Amanda. I'm going to come back to it because that's a good question. So hopefully we can we can hopefully we can sort this out by drawing it and then we'll come back to you and see if it makes sense to you, okay? So if we do this, we get this resonance structure. This is an OK resonance structure. Again, we're not ranking them yet. And then, but nothing is made, trying to use more than four orbitals. Carbon here has an empty orbital. But that's OK. It's not trying to, it's, it's using three. That's fine. Just can't use five because there aren't five. Then what we can do is you can use nitrogen's lone pair. To make a double bond to carbon. OK, note again, you know you're doing your resonance structures right if the total charge is always the same. The total charge on the first molecule on our first resonance structure is zero. Total charge on our second molecule is zero, minus one, plus one, zero, minus one, plus one, zero. If you ever fall off of that and your charges don't line up, you've made a mistake. Because no electrons are magically coming into the system or disappearing. Uh, Carolyn is right. Uh, Amanda, but that's what I said, so I'm not sure if that works. Yes. Yes, Jennifer, it absolutely is. Thank you for catching that. So um, we have these three resonance structures. Now, when we try and assign hybridization, we could do the thing that we did by inspection. The other thing is we can draw, try and draw resonance structures. And the, hybridize, the hybridization you pick has to satisfy all resonance structures. So if I said nitrogen was sp3, I would not be able to drive the, draw the right most resonance structure because it would not be able to make a pi bond. And yet, being able to do resonance is really stabilizing. So if nitrogen can do resonance, it will do resonance. 
and so nitrogen must be sp2 because if it's sp3 it can't do resonance I don't think we've lost a hydrogen. I think all the hydrogens are there. Oh, sorry, uh, Bar um, Bartulo is following up on Carolyn's com or Jennifer's comment. Yeah, you're both right. Okay. So, Sahana so asked a really quite good question. Are resonance structures always based on breaking double bonds, or can we move lone pairs to the original structure? Yes, you can. I'll do an example of that next. Um, but in this case, the, if we're drawing one arrow at a time, you have to start with breaking the bond in this case. Because if you drew one arrow at a time and tried to use lone pair from nitrogen to donate in and make a new nitrogen carbon bond, this poor carbon here would be like if I drew, this is wrong, don't do this. I'll do in blue ink. If I had drawn that blue arrow first, I would have ended up with this molecule. And what we're saying here is this carbon is using five orbitals. It is making three single bonds and two pi bonds. So it would need two p orbitals and it would need three sp2 orbitals. And that requires five orbitals and carbon only has four orbitals, so you can't do this. Uh, yeah, Nora, we'll, we'll get to that in a second. I, well, actually, no, we could draw that now. So the resonance hybrid comes from ranking the resonance structures. And again, we're going to get to that when we're going to talk about acids and bases and stabilizing charges and everything that goes into that. Uh, and why some charges are better than other charges. And we're only talking about resonance here, so we haven't talked too much about that. But generally, if everything is uncharged, that's best. Nothing wants to be charged. If things are charged, there's a ranking for why you might want to do one charges over another. And we're going to start talking about that next lecture. But your resonance hybrid always shows some charges. So it's great that the guy over on the far left is neutral. It's the most important thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. But where's the charge that actually, where's the partial charges that do exist? Well, actually, mostly on the nitrogen. Make the nitrogen slightly bigger. And we'll talk about a little bit about why. Uh, well, I can talk about this briefly now. Because I think this is a really important point, which I want to reiterate multiple times. Um, all negative charges are negative charges. A negative charge is I've got I've got more electrons than my valence says I should have, basically. But there are two different types of positive charges that are qualitatively different from one another. The nitrogen over here is what I call formally positive. You know. Nitrogen valence five. Five minus the number of electrons in lone pairs. There's zero. It's got no electrons in lone pairs. Minus one half the number of electrons in bonds. There's eight in bonds because there's four bonds. That equals plus one. That nitrogen is formally positive, but the nitrogen has eight electrons around it. It has its full octet. So although it's formally positive, it's not like technically positive, it's got eight electrons. All of its orbitals are doing something. So yeah, it's got, doesn't it would prefer to have a lone pair than sharing electrons in a bond, but that's okay, it can share. And it has all eight electrons around it, which is the most important thing. This carbon here though, is actually positive. The actually positive thing is not a technical term, um, but it's a way to think about that. That carbon only has six electrons. Does not have its full octet. 
For a second row element, not having your full octet is a disaster. Um, it's really, really, really bad. That's a really unhappy carbon. It desperately wants electrons. The nitrogen's thinking, well, I'm sharing, you know, I prefer not to share, but really I've got everything I need. The carb, like sort of sharing a house or apartment or something, the carbon's homeless, like it's missing electrons. It needs its electrons. Or it's like a druggie that needs a fix. It, like it just it's it's a really unhappy carbon. It wants eight electrons and it's only got six. And that having eight electrons is more important than whether you're positive or negative. You want eight electrons. So the resonance hybrid over here puts more of the positive charge on nitrogen and less on the carbon because this is a better resonance structure because in it everything has its full octet. And having your full octet is like the best thing ever if you're a second row element. Whereas in this one, the carbon does not have its full octet, so it's an unhappy carbon. Yeah, this is the least stable. So if I'm ranking these, one, two, three. Is number one, everything is neutral, which is best. Number two, we have charge, but everything has its full octet. Number three, we have charge and not everything has its full octet. So if we're gonna draw this, Whenever you're drawing these for the sake of making your life easy, and I think I talk about this in the lectures too, um, try and draw as much as you can in the plane of the page. Because if you try and draw it out of the plane of the page, it gets harder. So when, when you have like an SP2, that means you got three SP orbitals that are flat, Draw them in a plane. You're just going to make your life easier. They all kind of look like propellers because they're all 120 degrees from each other. As I go on about in the lectures endlessly. OK, so hopefully this is where we're going to get into the question about what the oxygen is doing. So um, coming back to Amanda's question going, why is the oxygen SP2? Why can't it be SP? Well, let's think about this carbon. This carbon has one P orbital. Remember, the most stable hybridization form any atom can be in is SP3. All the orbitals are lowered. There are no p orbitals left. So everything wants to be sp3 unless there is a reason for it not to be sp3. And the only reason not to be sp3 is because you need a p orbital to make a pi bond. And I'm going to delete octet up here so I can get my. So oxygen needs a p orbital to make a pi bond. Okay, but it could have two p orbitals. The thing is, is if oxygen gets another p orbital, it can't make a pi bond because it would be, well, if oxygen had another p orbital, it would be here, like it would be in the plane of the sheet, but there's no p orbital on carbon for it to interact with. That's parallel to it. So it would just be like a p orbital for nothing. But that's higher energy than if oxygen takes that p orbital and hybridizes it. To make it sp2 so being sp is worse than being sp2 like bsp2 every time you can bsp3 every time you can the only reason bsp is because you're making two pi bonds but this oxygen can't make two pi bonds at the same time because the only thing it can bond to is this carbon and this carbon doesn't have space for two p orbitals because it needs three of its orbitals to make single bonds to the things next to it so oxygen can't bsp because that would be stupid when it can't uh, make a p orbital with anything next to it. So instead, oxygen puts its lone pairs into sp2 orbitals. So the oxygen is sp2. The carbon is sp2. The nitrogen is sp2. And note that we haven't, again, haven't defined where the p orbitals are. The pi bond is, it could be between a carbon and nitrogen, it could be between a carbon and oxygen. 
Both those are possible. They're both possible at the same time. There's like these three p orbitals are all lined up, and in reality, the electrons are kind of smeared over all three of them at the same time. There's sort of uh, four electrons kind of smeared over these three centers. Because there's the two electrons in a carbon oxygen bond and a lone pair on nitrogen. Those four electrons are kind of all in those three atoms at the same time. And they don't really pick. They're they're happy everywhere. Why is nitrogen sp2? Shouldn't it be sp3? Nitrogen needs to be able to make a p orbital with carbon over here. So that's why we have a p orbital here. Yes, so uh, uh, if you need to draw a pi bond, you can just show one example. You don't need to, like, you just show, if you're drawing a pi bond on this, what I would do is I would probably draw the most stable one, which is, of course, from this neutral species. And so I would change the color of my pen. And I would indicate this is one half pi. And this is one half pi. Why one half? I could draw a line to both of them and say one pi, but like these two lobes interacting is half the bond, these two lobes interacting is the other half of the bond. And if I draw that, I'm not going to draw a double bond between carbon and nitrogen on there. I know it's possible because, hey, look, lone pair, like um, there's a, a p orbital there, and there's a p orbital there. So two p orbitals next to each other can always make a pi bond. But I'm just indicating, hey, this is where I'm putting it just for nailing it down, saying where the orbitals are. Okay, I see hat hat. Uh, yes, it says six electrons around it. It. Not full octet. By it, I mean carbon. So I didn't save myself any time writing it. And I think I confused people. Just it. Uh, why isn't there dotted lines representing the... So Victoria asked, why isn't there dotted lines representing the possible of bonds and resonance hybrid? Uh, oh, yeah, you're absolutely right, Victoria, because um, your professor is really, really wrong. That's why. You're absolutely right, Victoria. I'm very sorry. I was, my brain was already skipping ahead. So, Grace, hopefully that answers your question, because you're right as well. Um, nor call the bookstore uh, about buying your textbook. Or you can, yeah, call the bookstore. Just, yeah, call them. So one example I want to show, yeah, I, I'm really sorry. You guys were right. That's why that was that, and I was confusing. I'm sorry when I make mistakes that that's confusing. I want to show another example where um, we don't need to start by breaking a double bond. So watch out for nitrogen. It's a traitorous atom. So you might have a molecule like this. This is actually a very, very common molecule. It's ammonia, complex, uh, basically condensed onto formaldehyde. And um, so what we have here is a resonance structure where there are no double bonds to break. There's this carbon here is can accept electrons. So I'm actually forming a double bond. Do all resonance structures involve double bonds? Yes, yes, they do. There are double bonds somewhere. Uh, you can't draw resonance structures that don't have any double bonds at all. Uh, Sahana is a structure based on a resonance hybrid of the original structure. Um, I'm not sure what you mean. The structure at the bottom? Like the one in the middle bottom there. 
Um, it's based on a resonance hybrid. Because the original structure, if you could tell that that nitrogen was sp2 by looking at it, then sure, you can just go ahead and draw that. Like you describe this, this thing down here describes all three of those structures above it, plus the resonance hybrid. They're all the same. It, it, they're all encompassed in that. They're all present in that drawing. So in this case, we can draw a, um, a resonance structure without starting with breaking into a bond. But again, what we need to make sure we're doing is that never does any atom make five bonds or need five orbitals. If an atom needs five orbitals, you've screwed up. Um, let's say we had this molecule. Sorry, I'm drawing. I'm, I'm going to increasingly draw line structures here. So again, what this means is this is equal to right. So each of the ver. Uh, I think Dr. Hayward covered this in his lecture. Each of the vertices of any of these points is a carbon atom with all the hydrogens associated with it and the right number of electrons around it. And um, this is telling me there's a negative charge on this, so I know there must be a lone pair, because if I do the formal charge calculation, I know there has to be a lone pair. I am going to sketch in a lone pair for now, but I don't need to. It's appropriate to not do this. Yeah, this is a new example. So what I want to show is there's two ways you can do this, a resonance structure here. Um, so one way we can do this is we can draw one arrow at a time. This is always right. Always, always, always right. You can never go wrong if you draw one arrow at a time. Never. Another option you are allowed to do, because if we're ranking resonance structures, um, the left and right one are the same, because they're they're mirror image, like they're basically the same thing, right? It's just we move the negative charge, but there's nothing different between them. The middle one is bad because there are three different charges on it, and who needs three different point charges? That just seems like it's sucky. And it is. So if you want to skip the middle one because the middle one's stupid, you can, in which case what you would do is you could draw two arrows at the same time. Um, I'm going to do this a lot because it's just how I think and I'm going to try and stop. I'm going to try and do a one arrow at a time at least for the first bunch of classes but I will do two arrows at a time. And you notice I actually, I actually started with the left hand, with the right hand arrow. I started with moving the electrons, because um, I always think about the electrons moving. And I automatically pushed, I automatically drew the second arrow. Like I have to draw those two at the same time. Because if I just draw the first one, that's wrong, because that poor middle carbon will be making five bonds, and that's not possible. But I can do them simultaneously. If I do those red arrows, it takes me to that final thing in one step. Uh, I would accept, if I asked you to draw the resonance structures of this, I would accept either all three or just the N2 because the middle one is particularly stupid. When is resonance structure stupid? We'll get to that. Uh, it is not wrong to say that the middle one is a resonance structure. It's absolutely a resonance structure. It's just a stupid resonance structure. There, there's other resonance structures for this too. Nothing is stopping me drawing a resonance structure like this. It's just this one makes the middle one look like a sensible resonance structure because now I've got two negative charges. It's got three charges and two negatives right next to each other, which is really bad. Uh, they do. Everything here is minus one. Amber said, don't they all have to have the same charge? They do. Everything here is minus one. 
because in some of these cases, I've got two minuses and one plus, so the, one of the pluses cancels one of the minuses. Yeah. We don't need to do a lot of math, but we do need to count a little bit. Um, yes, it would. If, I, if I'm drawing in all the lone pairs, and I, you're, you're right, I probably should. Um, you don't need to. You don't need to draw in the lone pairs, Drake, on the carbon. The negative charge implies it, but thank you for that. I should be drawing them in right now, just to be clear. Uh, yeah, I hope when you, but that's basically it. When I'm asked to ask you to draw all of them, I, you don't need to draw the stupid ones. You need to draw the ones that contribute. And we're going to talk about trying to do that. It's going to be a sense. If you're ever in doubt, draw in the stupid ones. What if you have multiple double bonds? Does this make things a lot harder? Well, it expands the range of possible resonance structures. So let's do an example where we have multiple double bonds. Let's say we had this molecule here. OK, there's a pot. It's a, sorry, I drew it poorly. I should really make sure it's coming out of there. OK, so. Um, yeah, this is all for class. I'm just doing another example. You can leave. It's going to be recorded. You can take a look at it later if you want to catch up. Um, but yeah, go ahead to lab. I'm just going to this is kind of like people swarming. Yeah, class is over. This is just people swarming at the end of the class, talking questions, and I can just go on to the entire class for a little bit longer. And it gets recorded, so you can follow it up later. Uh, we're going to get to that next class, or the class after Aaliyah. Um, I recommend you watch the acid bases lecture. So, I think the class after, because we're going to talk about some functional groups next class. Uh, where can we find our, there? The link is on you is on syllabus, and they're all posted on YouTube. All the old lectures are posted on YouTube and they're hyperlinked in the syllabus. With the subject. It's 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 as easy as I could possibly make it. Without sort of locking in da specific dates to things because we're going to get off because I know that it always happens. No plan survives contact with the enemy and the class is the enemy of the plans. You're not my enemy, you're, 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 but you're the enemy of the plans of the class lecture times. So we're going to cover some stuff in more detail. We'll just skip over other stuff because it's easier. So if we have an example like this, um, those of you guys who are sticking around, take a few minutes. Uh, this year's lectures are all posted on YouTube. Um, you just go to the YouTube channel. They're also available on Teams. They are also on YouTube. It's the same YouTube channel. It says 2300 uh, playlist. I'll post the playlist again on the uh, as an announcement to the entire class so you can find it. Oh, what would the hybrid look like for the bottom left one? Um, its hybrid would look like. Overall negative charge on the hybrid. We haven't actually seen an overall charge thing, but there would be an overall negative charge minus one. A big minus over here and a big minus over here. It would be OK. You, this, the, I said the middle one was stupid. It wouldn't be wrong. To put a tiny little plus. Let's, so let's make these much bigger then. Big ass minus. Big ass minus. Should be about the same. I'm not getting out a ruler to measure. But if they're in the right same ballpark. Wouldn't be wrong to put a little plus in the middle one. You also could leave it off because it's a stupid resonance structure. I'd accept either. Uh, I think assignment X goes beyond it, and anything you're doing on any of my assignments is going to be harder than what you're going to have to do on the quizzes. Questions I ask are harder on those assignments. Uh, we did decide on a midterm date. I'm going to post that on YouTube, at, or not YouTube, Blackboard. Um, it's going to be a three hour exam on October the something 23rd, I think. October the 23rd, we we talked about one to four. I'm making it noon to four because somebody. Um, 
rightly said, can can we have a three hour exam in a four hour time slot? I went screw it. Why the hell not? So we're doing. I'm writing a three hour exam, but you're going to have four hours to do it in. Anyways, because they have something they want to do that afternoon, and I was feeling very generous, um, but it doesn't hurt anybody else. It helps everyone else, and it's fine. Okay, so top right one. Take a second. Those of you guys who are sticking around and um, try and draw some resonance structures of that. This material is hard enough, as I said. Um, it, it, I, I don't want to be making it harder. What time will the assignment be available? Well, you'll have 48 hours, so I think I need to double check the dates, but I think it's going to be Thursday midnight so that you can have like 11, like 12.01 a.m. Friday morning to 11.59 p.m. Saturday night. I try and avoid the midnight thing because it's unclear whether you're talking about the midnight the night before or the midnight of the night, so I don't like 12 o'clock because it does confuse people. So 12.01 a.m. Friday morning to 11.59 p.m. Friday night, Saturday night. Yeah, the next, like, this will line up more or less with that unless people have got a lot more questions about this stuff. Uh, sort of stability and functional groups, yeah. Solubility, electrostatics, intramolecular things. Anything anyone has any questions about that, if anyone emails me that, I'll do that. I'll answer questions that have. That stuff's pretty self-explanatory. Christian, and I think for most people it's going to be completely review. Yeah. So we want to focus on things that aren't review here. OK, so if you've started doing it. Um, if you're doing one arrow at a time, what color am I I'll try and do this? You've got two options. One is you can move the electrons from the electron uh, from the bond to the carbon. I'm actually just going to erase the height. I'm not going to draw the hydrogens in there. They're, they're assumed. Note this is a silly resonance structure because I've got three charges. And then I can draw a second arrow going to Double bond, we can't do double bond there. I could equally have kind of skipped that middle structure and gone straight to this guy by taking these electrons and kind of pivoting on the carbon. So, you know, stand up as I take a look at my camera. Um, can you see me? Yeah, but you can't see my legs. OK, so point down towards my legs. Let's see. If, there we go. So, you know, like let's say my. There we go. My front leg here is the carbon. My back that I want to move the electrons to my back legs here. The span of my legs is the whole bond. Um, you can't see enough for, but let's say the carbon I want to react with is a step forward. The first arrow I drew when I just drew a single arrow was I just moved the electrons from the double bond onto this carbon. There's now two electrons or two feet on this carbon. And then I step forward to move those electrons forward. So that's two steps. Or I'm allowed to pivot on one leg so I can pivot the electrons forward to create the new bond. That's also completely legitimate. That does not work as well over camera as it does in person. So it's fine for us to pivot the electrons around that central carbon. Because it's essentially two one, two arrows, two of those single arrows, one after another, without that stupid resonance structure that makes three charges. Now I can do that pivot again on the next double bond. And again, I'm avoiding that 
three charge thing, but it's fine. You can draw it with three charges if you like. You can break the old bond. Have an intermediate with three charges and then reform the old bond. That's okay. That's perfectly legitimate. It's just that middle one with three charges is stupid. I can't even write stupid properly. There we go, stupid. Now we can do this one more time with this triple bond. And it's really tempting to try and go, oh, it's a triple bond, it's got to be something really special. But just remember, a triple bond is just two double bonds that are perpendicular to one another. It's just another double bond. It's just a little weird because now there's a carbon that has two double bonds on either side. But the rules are no different. You're just pivoting the electrons. And you could do, again, you could draw it one at a time. You could put the two electrons from the triple bond onto the middle carbon, make it a C minus, and then push them out. But again, in that case, you would have three charges. It's difficult to keep track of the charges. Any tips? Um, if you're finding this difficult to keep track of the charges, it might help to draw out all the hydrogens all the way along. And you could even draw it as Lewis dot structures initially. So don't draw lines for bonds, draw the dots for the bonds. And then you'll start keeping track of all the electrons. The lines mean two electrons, right? That like the line means there's two electrons here making a bond. Um, but if you're having trouble just by inspection, sort of counting the electrons on something, count because here I haven't drawn in all the hydrogens. So you have to go where, where the hell is the charge coming from? Why, why is there a charge there? Um, I haven't drawn in the hydrogens. I'm tracking those, but if you draw in the high, if you repeat this exercise, if you had trouble following it, draw in all the hydrogens for all the atoms and see if you can then, at each resonance structure, you can calculate the formal charge on the carbons that are involved. Uh, is the both stable one to one on the bottom right? Um, no, it is not. It actually is really bad. Uh, the most stable ones are either are these these two, and I could differentiate between them and tell you one's more stable than the other. Uh, and it's true, and it's going to be, let me just think about that for a second. It's going to be this one. Uh, the reason for that is beyond the scope of the course. These two are, for the purposes of our course, these two are equally stable. We're going to talk about why those two are more stable than the, the other two. Yeah, like, yes, I, again, I think the thing to just remember, it's the, because just don't fall, yeah, you, you, okay, I'm answering Iosite's question. Can we say the stupid resonances are on their way, except they have to go through to make the more stable resonance structure? It's maybe a step you have to go through mentally, but remember that these electrons are not moving like this. Like, I'm drawing resonance structures here, and it's really tempting to think that these are interconverting. They're not. These are all the same thing. These all exist at the same time. I'm just arbitrarily drawing a double bond between two p orbitals that are next to each other instead of the other two p orbitals that are next to each other. But all those p orbitals exist. Those electrons are shared and smeared over the entire p surface. At the same time, like the, the resonance hybrid of this, the best description of reality, like resonance hybrids are the best descriptions of reality. Problem with resonance hybrids is they don't really explain very much. Sometimes. Without the individual resonance structures. Is that notice that the entire molecule is dotted. There is a partial positive charge on this guy. There are bigger pos partial positive charges, maybe a slightly bigger one on this one. And there's a little partial positive charge on here. The only bonds that are never broken are all the single bonds between the carbons and all the hydrogens, and one of the double bonds in that final carbon. But everything else is. So this is reality. Those, that, those, two, those electrons, um, one, two, three, four, those six electrons in this double bond, this double bond, and one of these double bonds are spread out over one, two, three, four, five, six, seven atoms. So they're in the pure, they're in, there are six electrons in seven p orbitals. And they're not going through any of these structures. 
mentally we're going through them to try and keep track of this. But those electrons are, those six electrons are spread out over these seven p orbitals. So they're not really going through the stupid ones. We're just using them for us to keep track of what's going on. Um, Malika, yeah, except you're, yeah, when you're pivoting like that, you're moving the two electrons, that you're moving the whole lone pair that's in that double bond. You're moving both of the electrons in the double bond, not just one. You're moving two of them and pivoting two of them. So you're basically, or yeah, or you can think of, if, if you're, you're thinking about this, you're stewing an electron from the terminal carbon and transferring it over to the other carbon. And the middle carbon there keeps its one electron. That's an okay way of thinking about it too. And I think that's what you're thinking about. You're good at this. Your way of thinking about it's fine. I just had to think for a second to catch up with you. Yeah. What you're what you're saying is absolutely fine and absolutely true and, and as, as true as anything I'm saying. There are electrons in orbitals and the orbitals are interacting all together. And yeah, I, I, I can I can hear most of you going, please make it stop. Um, doesn't. That's why this is the hardest stuff in the entire freaking course. It really, really is. This entire course is um, electron Lewis dot structures, which makes everyone feel comfortable. And then this crazy shit. And then we apply this for the rest of the term. And then basically where charges want, again, this course is all about where charges want to be and what makes them happy. And I'd say that's what this course is about, but that's just what chemistry is about. Like where electrons want to be and what makes them happy. Electrons go from being unhappy to being happy. It's, it's all there is to it. Why is the fifth carbon the most positive again? I didn't explain that. And I'm not going to today. I will explain it. Uh, and then this coming back to here, um, I'll use this example at a later date. I might just shorten and take out one of the double bonds because then we don't have an ambiguous case. Because I'm not going to explain why the fifth is more stable than the third. Yeah, it's beyond the scope of what we want to talk about, and it, I just won't ask you any questions like that. Uh, Sahana, we're going to come back to that. We haven't done that yet. So hopefully we're going to touch on that next class. because There's a whole lot of other things that go into it. We haven't touched on those topics yet. So right now I just want to think you think about how to draw resonance structures, not which one's most stable. If you do really want to know the answer to that question, uh, watch the acid base lectures. And we'll cover it. Okay. Um, I'm going to end recording here. <laughs>